Well, hello and welcome to Calvary Bible Church. My name is Colin Terenzini. I am the youth pastor here. And you may say to yourself, well, this is a kind of strange background. Well, this is actually our nursery. And the reason why I'm standing in the nursery is because I want to do a shameless plug. Um, if you are looking for an area to serve and volunteer, there is a ministry opportunity here. We are looking for uh, people to partner with already the people here that serve on a weekly basis in the nursery. Uh, please see Tamika Piper. More announcements. Um, Mother's Day is approaching quickly. And we uh, that's the deadline for First Step Pregnancy Clinic's baby bottles. If you haven't brought your baby bottles, you can uh, do so. You can drop them off in one of the baskets at the Conversation Cafe. Or you may say to yourself, well, I haven't even picked up a bottle yet. That's okay, there is still time. There are bottles out in the Conversation Cafe uh, that are empty. Feel free to bring them home. Fill them up with either coin, cash, or check and bring them back. And uh, all of that money is used to fund the mission at First Step Pregnancy Clinic. Um, another quick announcement, uh, not so much an announcement, but we just want to say thank you for your faithfulness in giving throughout the COVID time. We are a member attended supported church, which means um, that it's your money, your tithes and offerings that we use to fund uh, the ministries here at Calvary Bible Church. And so we're able to um, uh, have a clean environment. We're able to uh, teach your kids about Jesus. We're able to um, uh, put this out on Facebook and we're able to put this out on Peg TV. We're able to do all of that because of your tithes and offerings. So thank you for that. Um, three ways you can give. One, you can give by snail mail. Write a check to Calvary Bible Church. Uh, put it in the mail. Our address is 2 Meadow Lane. Second way, you can give online at cbcvt.org backslash giving. Or you can, if you're in the facility, you can uh, go out to the Conversation Cafe and there is a white tithes and offerings box. You can place your offering right in there. Uh, so that being said, we pray that today is going to be a day of change and transformation. We pray that today would be a day that we would represent Jesus well. We're glad you're here. God bless.
just uh, wave at the people around you and welcome them here. And uh, we'll continue with our worship. Um, one of the um, awesome things about that song that I love is uh, that it just proclaims that we serve a living God, that Jesus walked out of the tomb, that he did not stay dead. And um, one of the beautiful things in scripture is that, that Christ's death and resurrection is also a symbolic and powerful and a, and a reality for those that are, us, that are in Christ, that, that we have are died to ourselves and we live in him. And so I love this next song that talks about uh, what Christ's resurrection means to us. It's called Resurrecting.
ashes of defeat the resurrected king is resurrecting me in your name i come alive to declare your It is good to be with the people of the Lord today. If you have your Bibles, you turn with me to the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes, we are at the end of chapter 9 going into chapter 10. For those of you that might be just joining us, the word Ecclesiastes is a Greek word that means the one who assembles. In Hebrew, it's kohelet, very close uh, uh, to the Greek word ecclesia, which means the assembled ones are the church. Right? We are the church the assembled people of God. Isn't it good to know that the church is not four walls and a roof? You can shut down a building, but you can never shut down or close a church. And so our, our church has continued to meet together. We've also been privileged to, to meet uh, for quite some time now in this beautiful building that God has given us, and we can stay warm and dry. And uh, we've been submitting to our governing authorities, following mandates and guidelines, continuing to share the gospel, continuing to see God change lives in us and through us. And I just want to just uh, thank you. Thank you for your cooperation in all this. And we've received a lot of alkalides, uh, alkalides uh, from the, the health department, uh, other individuals for our proactive and loving approach in ministry. And so in a few weeks, uh, even our building is going to be used even some more. Project Vision is going to resume meeting soon, and we hope to continue to use what God has uh, blessed us with to, to bless and reach our community. Um, one of the, the lessons that I think I've learned uh, is throughout this pandemic is the importance of having convictions. And so, you know, as a church, uh, for our, the elder board, our convictions regarding the Bible, uh, regarding the gospel, uh, regarding the, the nature of the church, that helped to, to guide us as, as we navigated this river called COVID, all right? You, you can't wait until a crisis hits before you develop convictions. You have to decide on your conviction before you're tested, before you're tempted, uh, Pastor Colin likes to say the same thing to his students. You, you have to decide what to do before you're offered that joint, right? Before you find yourselves in the backseat of a car. Uh, the, the, the right convictions helps one make the right decisions. Um, how many have ever been whitewater rafting, uh, maybe kayaking, anywhere where you've had to go down a, a river? And you know the importance of having a guide when you're going down a river, 
a guy that knows the river, because when you come to a boulder in the middle of the river, there's often a choice. Do I go left or do I go right? Uh, The choice you make in that boat, how quickly you make that choice will determine whether often you will face success or whether you will face catastrophe, whether you'll be safe or whether you'll face disaster. And so having the right guide, having the right individual that knows the river is, is essential. And that guide has to be competent. Uh, the boat is so important to, to steer, and it's so important that the right choices are made. I think it's a good picture of life. As we, as we navigate life, we have a guide, a very reliable guide called the Bible, and it's a, the only competent guide for godliness. You can't live a, a, a successful, God-pleasing life without the guide that God has given us in his word. And so reading, obeying God's word helps us to know which way to turn when we come across boulders, when we come across crisis. And so if we have convictions that are based upon the word of God, when we face a crisis, when we face a boulder in the middle of our life, we can make the the quick choices and avoid painful consequences. And so we're in a section of scripture called wisdom literature. Uh, It includes the Psalms, Proverbs, Song of Songs, Ecclesiastes. Uh, They're called the wisdom books. And so if you want a a straightforward, uh, no-nonsense approach to life, the wisdom books are one of the quickest routes there. um, and many of you, you may still use maps. I brought a map with me today. Uh, We live in backpacking paradise. All right, and uh, and so could you imagine trying to hike and you take out you know a huge map, huge topographical map, and you try to find you know which way you are and, and how you're going in there? It's a wonderful map. It has everything you need to know for half the state, right? Every every elevation change that you go through. Um, but it is nice when you're actually hiking on a trail, not to have half the state with you, but to have a very specific, quick little map of just the trail with just the right turns that you make. Uh, to help you to get from point A to point B. And so in Ecclesiastes 9, going to chapter 10, we're going to get these nuggets, the the condensed uh, nuggets of counsel. Um, And it's going to explain to us how we live in a day where wickedness is not punished and where righteousness is not rewarded. How do you live in a day, how do you live in a society where uh, your convictions are different than the convictions that you see all around you? Um, how do you continue to, to live and find purpose when you reap, right? What, when you don't reap what you expected based upon what you sowed? And so we live in a society that, that lives for pleasure but experiences no happiness. We, we discovered uh, that the true joy, real joy, can be experienced in the simple things as blessings if they're enjoyed as gifts from God. And we saw that the world's vision of wisdom the world's version of what is wise uh, is better than no wisdom at all, all right? And so th- there is, there's a benefit to that, but uh, following the world's wisdom will not necessarily end up in reward as the world defines reward. And so last week we saw the world's wisdom flipped on its head when, when a poor man saved a, a city uh, from a powerful king, but in the frustrating twist, the, the, the savior of the city was not recognized, wasn't appreciated. And so the, the writer tells us, Kohela tells us, don't give up in wisdom. Don't, don't follow the applause of the crowd. Follow wisdom. Have convictions. Trust that God has a purpose and a plan And live for him. And so that's where we are as we come to Ecclesiastes 9, uh, verse 17. And so if you are here in person, I'm going to invite you to stand with me in honor of the word of God. Ecclesiastes 9, starting verse 17. uh, And uh, I'll be reading out of the ESV today. So hear God's word. The words of the wise heard in quiet are better than the shouting of a ruler among fools. Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroys much good. Dead flies make the perfumer's ointment give off a stench, so a little folly outweighs wisdom and honor. A wise man's heart inclines him to the right, but a fool's heart to the left. Even when the fool walks on the road, he lacks sense, and he says to everyone that he is a fool. If the anger of the ruler rises against you, do not leave your place, for calmness will lay great offenses to rest. There is an evil that I have seen under the sun, as it were an error proceeding from the ruler. Folly is set in many high places, and the rich sit in a low place. 
I've seen slaves on horses and princes walking on the ground like slaves. He who digs a pit will fall into it, and a serpent will bite him who breaks through a wall. He who quarries stones is hurt by them, and he who splits logs is endangered by them. If the iron is blunt and one does not sharpen the edge, he must use more strength. But wisdom helps one to succeed. If the serpent bites before it is charmed, there is no advantage to the charmer. Father, we we thank you that uh, we don't have to navigate this river of life alone. We thank you that we aren't left to be swept away by the currents of our day and our culture. Uh, Thank you that, that you do direct the hearts of kings. And we pray today that you would direct our hearts as well. Uh, And I pray that we would look to you for purpose. We thank you for your Holy Spirit, again, that illuminates your word and points us to Jesus. Let him be our helper and our guide. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. So we have this collection of, of, of short, pity statements. Some of them, you're like, what is he talking about? All right? And uh, I, I love Ecclesiastes. It, it takes a little work to kind of figure out and look at the, the meaning of this. But verse 17, it's a perfect bridge from where we left off last week. Uh, last week, we, we heard again that wi- having uh, some wisdom is better than no wisdom. And so here we're told that the words of the wise heard and quiet are better than the shouting of a ruler among fools. Verse 17. And so again, last week, we saw the situation where the the powerful king is going to overwhelm the small city, but despite his strength and power, uh, despite the overwhelming odds uh, that would have been unheard of in its day, wisdom, unappreciated wisdom, ended up saving the day. And I I hinted at this last week, but it's a paradigm for, for what the world thinks is foolish, what the world thinks doesn't make sense actually turns out to be the power and the strength of God. That's what Paul says. You know, that, that's the message and means of our ministry, that the cross, even though it seems like foolishness, is the power of those who are being saved. And so, we, I mean, we can turn on, on the TV uh, you know, and start scrolling through social media, and you hear a very loud, very powerful voice, actually a lot of loud, powerful voices, trying to convince you that a lie is the truth. And a general tactic seems to be that the louder the, the lie is, the more true it must be, the more you must believe it. And, and so the, the measure of what is true today isn't necessarily facts or evidence, what can be observed, but, but how many people are joining with the chorus of those that are saying it. The louder it is, and, and the majority is right, and so the tactic, even of the minority, is to scream so loud that, that their, their voice seems louder than it actually is. And so even if the minority is louder than the silent majority, the minority wins. And uh, for those of you that have been around a while, you might, you might feel like that the voices against Christianity are just getting louder and louder, like the volume is being turned up. The more that I try to live for Jesus, the more I, I feel that there are more voices that are stacked up against me. And so we're going to be encouraged through these, these collection of, of sign, sayings here to not give up to not give up on what is wise, to to remember what side we're on, to not compromise what is true, to not compromise what is right. Because sadly, the the only thing louder than voices is behavior. And wisest action or the wisest voice can be undone by one bad action. That's kind of what verse 18 hints at here. Wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroys much good. It's actually a pretty scary verse when you think about it. Uh, you, can, you can live your entire life for Jesus and you can have your testimony unravel with one mistake. That's pretty scary. And, and we don't have to look too far for examples. Penn State, Baylor, Michigan State, SMU, Bill Cosby. Um, all the work that, that one does to build something great, it can be gone. It can be canceled with one bad decision. And so, I mean, you turn on the news and, and the media loves to, to, to trumpet hypocrisy when they can see it, especially in Christians. And we have to understand, if, if we make the decision, I'm going to live for Jesus, that's like painting a big target on your back, right? Because the quickest way for, for Satan to discredit what we say is to, to silence us through a, a, a poor action. And so you can talk a good talk, but it's our actions that undo words, 
Uh, I love verse 1 of chapter 10. Dead flies make the perfumer's ointment give off a stench, so a little folly outweighs wisdom and honor. That's a fun little verse. Uh, you know, imagine, imagine walking into a restaurant. And, uh, you know, and, and this is, imagine this is post-COVID and so you don't have to wear a mask or anything. You just walk in this restaurant, you're ready for a good meal, and you're greeted with this warm aroma of, of the most amazing vegetable soup being stewed over the, the stove and carrots and onions and celery just, just perfectly sautéed in a nice rich broth. The chef is carefully stirring the soup and then you look above the pot and there is a bug zapper hanging right above the soup. And, 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 and you watch around, and every so often you hear this little zip, and you see a little dead fly fall into that soup. And so I don't care how good that soup smelled before. All of a sudden, that smell is going to make you, you know, your stomach just churn. I might have had to pick on vegetable soup because I hate vegetable soup. But because um, um, it's not going to affect me at all, right, that imagery. Um, so, but but Paul, you know, Paul said the same thing. He said a little leaven leavens the entire lump. You can, be, you can be 99% wise and 1% fool, and that 1% fool is going to completely outshadow the 99%. All right? that, that's, the, that's the way it works. And, and so, and again, note, when I say a fool, I'm not talking about someone with low intelligence. Right? A fool, in a biblical sense, it, it's more associated with, with wicked behavior. All right? Wisdom is, is fearing and obeying God, and so a fool says in his heart, there is no God. Psalm 14. Uh, a fool is not controlled by the Spirit. A fool is controlled by selfish, impulsive, self-centered behaviors. A fool is unwilling to listen to truth. A fool won't be changed by a truth. Uh, a fool is, is short-sighted. And so that, that's why uh, when we are faced with a moment of crisis or temptation, uh, a fool is going to choose the, 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 the decision that seems the most expedient to him and is not going to look long-term, is not going to be governed by truth. Verse 2, it says, A wise man's heart inclines him to the right, but a fool's heart to the left. They're they're lacking a guide. They're lacking truth. A a Christian's heart is changed by God. By definition, we were a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. And so when we let God guide decisions, we we choose what is wise. And and so I I need to uh, take a step back here and apologize to all the left-handed people out there. Uh, You know, the the Bible in general treats the the right side as as the good side. You know, it's a side associated with with strength. Uh, The right hand was was used to to bless. Like when when, when Jacob, uh, you know, crossed his hands... You know, for, for when, it, when, the son, when his grandchildren were put in front of him and he put his right hand on Ephraim's head and his left hand on Manasseh, and, and dad's like, no, 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 you mixed him up. Put your right hand on the older son. And, and, and uh, Jacob's like, nope, I, I've, I've done this on purpose here. Um, Judges 3, one of my favorite Bible stories, you have fat king Eglon, remember? And uh, you have Ehud, the left-handed judge. And, and so when, when he comes into the throne room, the, the soldiers, they check his right arm. You know, they figure, okay, that's the strong arm. That's the, the side that the sword would be on if there's a sword. And they forget to check the left side. And sure enough, um, um, Ehud, the left-handed judge, kills fat Eglon. You know, and everybody's surprised because the left side isn't normally the strong side. Um, the, the right hand is a symbol of authority. As well, Jesus is pictured as, as sitting at the right hand of the Father. Um, even at the, at the final judgment, the, the sheep are on the left, or, the, uh, or I'm sorry, the sheep are on the right, the goats are on the left. Um, you know, even, even today, in, in politics, the, the left movement, it was intended to be a derogatory phrase indicating a slide away from morality. You know, but, and so that, that's where it comes from. But when, when Kohelet says that the fool's heart leads him to the left, it, he's not making a political statement. It's a statement about the, the morality of one's decisions in his life. And so it, it, it implies a direction. Which direction are we going to choose in life? Um, um, how does your life smell right now? All right? Is, is, the smell, is, is, is it like perfume or is it essence of fly? Right? Um, everything in life follows the heart. If the heart is right, behavior follows. And, and that's why you know, I think it's important for us as Christians not to get caught up in, in, in social issues, you know, in behaviors that we see in our society, because you fight for social issues, um, oftentimes it's a losing battle. You know, in business terms, uh, you're following the lag, not the lead. 
Right? The, the, the lead is what drives the lag. Right? And, and if, if uh, you'll never make any lasting changes if you follow what follows, right? you're always playing cleanup. Right? And it, but if you, if you change the lead, if you change the, the thing that matters, you can have real lasting change. And the lead for society is, is not behavior, it's the heart. And, and so, you know, for example, maybe this has happened to you. It happened to someone uh, close to me uh, this week. Their septic system got all blocked up, right? And so every time they flushed the toilet, sewage would, would flood their basement, right? Not, not, it's a stinky problem. But the problem, you know, even though it feels like it's the problem, it was not the sewage, right? It, it, the problem was unseen. The problem was hidden. The problem is the clog that's blocking everything up. And you could spend all day, every day cleaning up the sewage, thinking that you're correcting the problem, but you're just correcting a symptom of the problem. You have to get to the root of it. Uh, this is hard for parents to do because parents get fixated on behavior, and we want to correct behavior. And, and, and we, we, uh, we, we, but generally, those behaviors, they're, they're symptoms of a greater problem. And so you, you figure out what is the, the core issue, what is the heart issue, what is the need. Oftentimes for kids, the need is for attention, right? Those of you that are teachers know that they, the kids are starved for attention, and they know the quickest, most expedient route to get attention is to misbehave. Right? Because I can do good things and hey, nobody seems to notice, it's expected, but if I break the rules, there is immediate feedback, there's immediate attention. And they don't care whether it's good or bad, but they need the attention. And so we, we look at our society and we see all these behaviors around us, uh, immorality, uh, perverted, twisted lifestyles, and, and it's not the problem. They're symptoms of the problem. The problem is not behavior, the problem is a heart that needs Jesus. And, and I think it's important for us to know that we can't change society without changing the hearts of the people in the society. It's the heart that's the problem. That's why you know, the gospel is at the forefront of everything we do. The, the good news of Jesus alone has the power to change the heart. I mean, so, I mean, that's why, you know, you, you don't invest yourself in, you know, social work, economic development, you know, racial reconciliation efforts, all good things, but it's like picking flies out of the soup you know, at ignoring the bug zap or hanging above the pot. You know, and sadly, you know, those that are engaged in foolish behavior, they, they don't often recognize it's a heart issue. What's the core issue? Verse 3, even when the fool walks on the road, he lacks sense, and he says to everyone that he's a fool. They, they tend to flaunt their folly. They don't even recognize it in themselves. Everybody else can see it, but they don't see it. Proverbs 13, 16 says, Every prudent man acts with knowledge, but a fool flaunts his folly. And so all we know about the heart, again, the heart is hidden. It's that hidden clog. It's that hidden problem. All we know about a person's heart is what we hear and what we see. If a person says things contrary to, to Scripture and they do things contrary to Scripture, they more than likely don't have a heart changed by God. Right? Jesus said it this way. He said that, Luke 6.45, the good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good. The evil person out of his evil treasure produces evil for out of the abundance of the heart, what? The mouth speaks. In a few weeks, we're going to begin a study of the book of James, and it talks quite a bit about the, the, the tongue, the power of the tongue. The tongue is a, a thermometer for the heart. If, if our words are angry and hateful and, and perverse, it's an indication of a heart that is angry and, and hateful and perverse. And so foolish behavior, foolish talk, they indicate a foolish heart. And so what do we do? How, how do you deal with foolishness? Uh, verses 4 through 7 is going to give us some advice for, for dealing with foolish people that, that we meet. Uh, some of us live with fools, uh, some of us work with fools, uh, some of us are even governed by fools, all right? Uh, <laughs> and, and the behavior can, can disrupt homes, uh, you know, a foolish behavior can disrupt workplaces, foolish behavior can disrupt society at large, and Ecclesiastes actually has quite a bit to say about political foolishness. Verse 4, if the anger of the ruler rises against you, do not leave your place, for calmness will lay great offenses to rest. There's an evil that I've seen under the sun as it were an error proceeding from the ruler. Folly is set in many high places, and the rich sit in a low place. I've seen slaves on horses and princes walk on the ground like slaves. You know, in other words, that, that 
you may not have the wisest individual sitting on the throne. You can have a, a King Eglon. You can have a Nebuchadnezzar, a Nero on the throne. You can have on the flip side a Daniel thrown into prison, a Paul thrown into prison. Uh, you can expect that life isn't going to make sense all the time. And so Kohelet's going to remind us, he says, don't give up. Keep follow, following God. Have the right convictions. Uh, what do you do if it looks like you're going to be punished for being righteous? What do you do? Uh, do you abandon wisdom, the wisdom of God, and, and do what the world says is most expedient? Uh, our obedience is not dependent upon recognition or reward. We stick with our convictions. I love the, the story of, of David in the cave. I remember when Saul goes into the cave to... To, to relieve himself, and, and David has this opportunity, and all his men are like, hey, didn't, weren't you anointed to be king? You know, isn't this the guy that's been persecuting us and hunting us? Hey, you can take him out right now. You kill him now, and tomorrow you're going to be king. And David says, no, uh, don't raise your hand against the Lord's anointed. But, but wait, David, you know, all the pain that you're feeling right now, it's right here. This is God delivering Saul into your hand. You couldn't ask for a better situation. And David says, no, it's not right. It, it, it might be the right end, but it's not the right means. And the means, uh, the, you know, the end does not justify the means. You know, and, and for us and, and government as well, it, it doesn't matter who is in the White House, who's in government. We have a biblical conviction. We submit to human authority as though sent by God, unless it causes us to disobey God. And then even if we do disobey, uh, we are still under judgment from them. We, we, will, we are no promise that we will escape punishment from government if we disobey government. And so rulers, they're accountable to God, but sometimes we have to understand, you know, fools can get elected, fools can inherit the throne. And we have to ask ourselves, did God make a mistake? Life, you know, it seems like, God, you, you made an accident here. Uh, and, and sometimes I'm living from one accident to another. You know, verse 18, or I'm sorry, verse 8, he who digs a pit will fall into it. And a servant will bite him who breaks through a wall. He who quarries stones is hurt by them, and he who splits logs is in danger by them. You know, four situations here. You can work hard, you can do all the right things, but accidents are going to happen in life. I mean, nobody plans on falling into a pit. And nobody plans on getting bit by snakes. Nobody likes having rocks fall on their heads. Um, accidents happen, but don't live by accident. That's the, the point here. Don't, don't live by accident. Have a plan. Accidents happen. Life happens. Know what you believe. Know what your convictions are so that when accidents happen, you don't have to decide between what is right or what is left, which way I'm going to go. Uh, Kohelet's going to give us two great analogies to help us with this. He says, verse 10, if the iron is blunt and one does not sharpen the edge, he must use more strength, but wisdom helps one to succeed. I love that. Verse 10 compares wisdom to a sharpened blade. Now, um, I don't know how many other guys are like me. I love knives, right? Uh, I mean, you know, fast, uh, po kitchen knives, pocket knives, swords, it doesn't matter. I like them, and I also like them really, really sharp, right? And I drive Christy nuts because every time she puts a kitchen knife down and I'm trying to pick it up and sharpen it for her, um, you know, to me, it's an act of selfless love, right? I don't want her to have to push harder. I don't want her to lose control of the blade. I don't want her to strain herself cutting our food. And I'm not sure she sees it that way, but she humors me most of the time. Those of you that, that you know, have ever used an ax, you know the, the frustration of using a dull blade. Right? It takes so much more work to, to use a dull blade than a sharp blade, and you end up hacking and flailing away at whatever it is that you're working on. And oftentimes you're not even successful. It's frustrating. I mean, you, you don't take a butter knife with you to cut down a tree. And, and, but this is the way that foolish people live. That they flail their way through life. They hack at whatever is before them without making progress. They endanger themselves and others. And they don't make any progress. You know, and, and oftentimes it may not even be sinful. I mean, it's not sinful to try to cut down a tree with a butter knife. It's just not wise. It's, it's much wiser to, to sharpen the edge of the tools 
that you're working with. And so it's one thing to have the right tools and to have them in the right condition, but it's also the right thing to use them at the right time. Look at verse 11. If the serpent bites before it is charmed, there is no advantage to the charmer. And so here's the, here's the picture. Here's a man, and he's got the, the skills to train a snake. Right? And, and what the proverb here is saying is it's better to train the snake before you're bit than after you're bit. Right? It's no use having the skill if you only apply it after you're bit. You know, there, there's a right time to train the snake and there's a wrong time to train the snake. And, and so snake charming is one of those skills that you want to apply preemptively. Right? And, uh, you know, that, that's why, you know, uh, for, for us as a ministry, we are so uh, um, strategic in investing so much time, energy, staffing, resources to children and students' ministries. Because we know it is better to be preemptive, you know, with, with our kids. It's better to, to plan ahead, to train them uh, for disaster rather than try to pick up the pieces afterward. So you have the right tools, you apply them at the right time. And, and if you are a parent or have teenagers in your life, you know, it's, a, it's a, a great window of opportunity that you have right you know, before they're ready to go off to college, right before they're ready to leave home. It's such a precious window because the, the convictions that, that you develop during those years are going to dictate the direction of their lives. And some of you, you know, that grew up in Christian homes, you know, you might know this. You, you may have been sheltered uh, from all sorts of temptations, and then all of a sudden, there's no more shelter, right? You, you go off, and all of a sudden, you're bombarded. And without the, the strong convictions, it, it's easy to give in. Uh, in. In my case, you know, I, I came from small-town Pennsylvania, and uh, I went from small-town Pennsylvania to University Park, Pennsylvania, uh, to, to Penn State with over 40,000 undergraduates living in dormitories. I mean, the size of a small city. Uh, you know, and I had no idea what I was getting into. You know, and they paired me with some strangers, a roommate. And so I, I called him a few weeks before class started, and I spoke to him over the phone. He seemed like a really nice guy. You know, he came from a Quaker background, real quiet, uh, moral person. He wanted to focus on his studies, avoid troubles. Like, hey, that sounds pretty good. The first night on campus, Saturday night, I remember it, my roommate went to a frat party, and he had his first beer. A week later, he's smoking weed and experimenting with drugs. Two months later, unbeknownst to me, he was selling shrooms out of our dorm room. You know, six weeks, he went from quiet, nice kid to drug dealer. You know, and, and here's the, the, the scary thing. We were both invited to the same party. That Saturday night. And, and I really wanted to make friends. I'm in this new place. I wanted to fit in. It would have been so easy to say Yes. By the grace of God, I said no. And that same night, that same night while my roommate was off partying, having his first sip of beer, I sat in my dorm room. I felt like a prude. I felt like an outcast. Did I make the right mistake? And all of a sudden, two guys show up in my dorm room from a group called Campus Crusade for Christ. And uh, they invited me to a freshman Bible study. And I told them I was a Christian. One of them invited me to church the next morning. And right away, you know, I'd found a group of friends to support and encourage me. I had a mission, a purpose, and it wasn't easy. I mean, my roommate and I, we, we, we drifted further and further apart. Uh, my alarm clock would go off when he was just getting in from a night of partying, and he didn't appreciate that. Um, you know, he would, he would laugh at me and tease me when I would try to share the gospel with him. And, and he ended up, you know, failing every one of his classes. You know, and after that first year, he went his way, I went my way. I never saw him again. You know, two different directions. And then uh, that year, a pretty girl named Christy joined her college fellowship. You know, and, and, uh, and it turns out when she was a little girl, she made a list of qualities that, that she wanted in her husband. It turns out that uh, a guitar-playing pastor was just what she wanted, right? <laughs> Mad knife-sharpening skills weren't on her list. But God is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, right? <laughs> anyway, I'm getting off track. Um, and anyway, you can look back at that Saturday night on campus as, as, as a turning point in my life. You know, it was, it was a decision. I can go left or I can go right. But here's the thing. My decision wasn't made that Saturday night. It, it was made years before when, when I was sitting in a youth group. And I heard my youth pastor say, drunkenness is a sin. 
Uh, my, my decision to save myself from my wife, it didn't happen on prom night. It happened at a Word of Life camp when I was 13 years old, and I signed a pledge that I would save myself from marriage. And, and I'm not trying to say, you know, I was perfect by any means. I think God, by his grace, protected me. He knew that, um, he, he knew what he was doing. But the, the truth is, I make a lot of mistakes. I have regrets. I have wounds that I carry with me, and I will carry with me to my grave. I still wrestle with forgiveness with, with those that have hurt me. Um, I, I see a lot of my flaws in my own kids, and, and I know deep down inside that they didn't learn it on their own. All right? They, they learn those behaviors and patterns from me. And some of you, you have scars and you have struggles in your past as well. You know, maybe for every time that you went right, there are two more times that you went left. And, and maybe you're in the middle of a big decision right now when you literally feel like you're in a snake pit. Uh, maybe maybe you, you've, you've clothed yourself in, in morality and fake smiles to hide the fact that there's a broken heart underneath. You know, there's a, a good example in Scripture. There's a guy, and uh, he became known as Paul, but he wasn't always known as Paul. He was known as what? Saul, right? And he was a Pharisee. He had all the education. He had all the friends. He had all the social status. He had the moral high ground, he thought. He was living a life pleasing to God, he thought, until God knocked him off his high horse and struck him blind, right? And, and God might have to strike us to get our attention. You know, and the, the hard thing is, though, I mean, God, uh, you know, Elijah learned this on the mountain. You know, he, God wasn't in the, the wind. It wasn't in the earthquake. It wasn't in the fire. Where was God's voice? In the low whisper, Scripture says. I love that. Sometimes God might be just whispering to your heart and, and, and trying to navigate life without him as your guide is not going to end well. You know, Jesus told a parable about a wise man and a fool, Matthew 7. And he said, uh, and, and you can even turn there with me, Matthew 7, verse 21, it says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness." Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a what? A wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall because it, was, it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against the house, and it fell. And great was the fall of it. You know, there's, there's a, a lot to that little parable. There, there's the, the, the two houses, and the repetition, and the storm, and the wording, and everything indicates that, that it's not a difference in the houses, Right? The, the, the contrast is not between people who hear the word of God and people who don't hear the word of God. Both people hear the word of God, but one acts upon the word of God and one does not. And the scary thing is, we can't tell the difference. You know, On the surface level, you can't tell which is which. Both appear the same. There, there's nothing that differentiates the houses. The difference is not on the roof. The difference is not on the walls, the windows, the doors. The difference is where? The foundation. And, and people, we, we look the same. Right? We, we, you know, we, we might know about Jesus. We talk about Jesus. Uh, people might even use his name and do good works in his name. Maybe they, they go to church. Maybe they have even gone to seminary. They read Christian books by Christian authors, some of them long dead. They appear very spiritual. On the surface, it looks like it's a good house. It's a good building. It looks like a great house, but you can't see the foundation from the outside. And what reveals foundation is what? The storm, right? The storm reveals who's wise and who's the fool. And I, and I would submit, and, and if you walk away with nothing else, walk away with this, that, that it is the foundation that supports you through life, and that foundation is a changed heart. A heart that is changed and governed by Jesus helps us navigate life. And also so that you can, you know, 
hold up under the storm. And, and the ultimate storm that we all will face is a day called the judgment day. And on that day, some people are going to say, Lord, Lord, and he's going to say, depart from me, I never knew you. And at that point, you know, it is too late to start training snakes. Right? The storm hit. There's no heart change, no foundation, and all the good work, all the moral living, all the wisdom, it turns out it was overshadowed by one foolish decision that we made not to receive the free gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter if we live with the morality of a Pharisee or if we lived our life as if it were a frat party. When we accept Jesus, all sin is forgiven. Jesus you know, I love it in Psalm 103, it says, As high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who please him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. You know, it's, and, and the key is the, the fear of the Lord, you know, that passage says. The Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. You know, I'm not fear in the sense of terror, the fear of the Lord's beginning of wisdom, that means surrender, worship him. And surrendering Jesus, it starts with a turn, not, not necessarily to the left or to the right, but a full 180. Right? That's where, what repentance means, that I was trusting in my works to get to God. And I give up on that, and I decide to trust in Jesus who loves us so much that he gave his life to save us. That's the wisest decision that we could ever make. So if, if you're listening now and, and you have not made that decision to, to trust in Jesus as your Savior, I want to close in prayer and give you an opportunity to make that decision. And I'm going to lead you in a prayer. And, and it's not the, the words necessarily that save you. It's, it's the heart that, that is surrendered to Jesus, a heart that is ready to change. And so with every eye closed, every, every head bowed, if you are ready to make that decision, if you are ready to say, I've had it and I've been trusting my own works, my own, uh, my own efforts to save myself, and it is not working and I need a guide that is faithful and true, I need Jesus Christ, if that is you, would you just raise your hands out to God and, and, and in this moment, would this be the cry of your heart? You can pray to him right now. You can ask him right now and you can pray with me and say something like this. Dear Jesus, I I am a sinner and I am sorry. I repent and turn from my sin and want to turn to you, Jesus, as my Lord and Savior. I ask you to forgive me. I believe that you died on the cross for my sin. I believe that you rose from the dead, conquering death. And so I surrender my heart to you. Take control and make me the person you want me to be. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. And if you are, if you just pray that prayer, if you have turned your life over to Jesus, you are part of a family that, that loves you and wants to support you and help you as you grow. We want to help you as you, as you, as you become more familiar with God's word. Uh, we encourage everybody to, to be involved in a, a good church, uh, to attend a, a Bible study, to, to grow in your faith, and, and actually to go and be the church because God has changed your life and you have a story to tell so that others' lives might be changed as well. So with that in mind, God bless you. Go be the church. We'll see you next week.